Hello, and thank you for joining us for our VOA News panel on What Happened in Afghanistan, a conversation with retired General Frank McKenzie and retired General Joseph Votel. I'm Carla Babb, VOA's Pentagon correspondent and the moderator for this Zoom panel, which is also streaming on our social media platforms. My co-moderator is Hasib Ali Kozai, the Chief of VOA's Afghan Service, and he will also be taking a couple of questions from the audience in the final minutes of this panel. General McKenzie and General Votel are both former commanders of U.S. Central Command, responsible for U.S. military operations in the Middle East, including the war in Afghanistan. General Votel commanded from 2016 to 2019, and General McKenzie commanded from 2019 to 2022, making them the final CENTCOM commanders to oversee a U.S. military presence in Afghanistan as the U.S. evacuation was completed almost a year ago today. General Votel is president and CEO of Business Executives for National Security and joins us from his home in Minnesota. And General McKenzie is the executive director of both the Global and National Security Institute and Cyber Florida at the University of South Florida, where he joins us. Thank you both for sharing your insights with us today. So gentlemen, let's start with your thoughts on what went wrong in Afghanistan, starting first with you, General McKenzie, and then to you, General Votel. Carla, first of all, thanks for having me on the program. It's great to join Joe Votel and other distinguished guests to, to talk about this important subject. So I, I've, it's been a year. I've had an opportunity to give a lot of, a, a lot of thought to this subject. And my, my belief is that the, the core decision that caused the tragic events of last August was our decision to leave Afghanistan completely. And that decision was a decision that really spanned two presidencies, President Trump and President Biden. Uh, they both uh, probably as unlike as any presence in American history, but they both shared a desire to to go completely out of Afghanistan. And I think the decision and the and the and the and the, and the, the implementation of that decision led inevitably to what happened last August. That was the key decision, and all the other things that followed uh, came as came as a result of that. And we can go in the subordinate decisions, but I think that the idea that we could leave and that the Af Afghanistan would still be able to defend itself without on the ground support, uh, even if it was indirect support, uh, I didn't agree with that at the time. I don't agree with it now. And I think events have, have borne out the truth of that, of, that, uh, of that hypothesis. And I'll pause there, Carla, and we can, we can go on and I'll be happy to further discuss it. So, Carlo, let me uh, let me jump in here. And and first off, good to be with you and Hasib, and of course with my uh, my good friend Frank McKenzie here. Um, yeah, you've you've asked an important question, and and one that I think takes a lot of a lot of reflection. Um, and I think uh, Frank really hit the hit the hit the hit the big idea there. You know, I, I think it's important to recognize that departure would have been difficult under almost any circumstance that we could have uh, could have created. Uh, but I do think uh, that we we failed to appreciate uh, the impact of a political narrative. I think that emphasized our departure over a long period of time and what that what that uh, had the effect that that had on the psyche of uh, of not only Afghan forces but the Afghan people and certainly the Afghan government, um, and uh, and I think contributed uh, to a large degree to the to the challenge of trying to depart this country, which, as I mentioned, was going to be hard under any any circumstances that we could uh, that we could imagine. I also think, frankly, that there's probably some differing assumptions and some differing expectations, certainly with the Afghans, certainly with our NATO partners, and then probably certainly within our own government here as we as we uh, as we uh, orchestrated this departure. So maybe I'll stop there and we can we can move on. Certainly. And I just want to follow up with you, General McKenzie. You, you said leaving was um, a big mistake. Uh, you wanted to keep 4,500 troops in Afghanistan. When that advice was rejected, then you tried, you recommended keeping 2,500. What would that have looked like? What would that U.S. presence have looked like? So 2,500 troops would have given us a small, very hard platform, series of bases in Afghanistan, Afghanistan that would have included Bagram Air Base. It would have given us the ability to continue to support the Afghan logistics system, would have given us the ability to continue to support the Afghan Air Force on the ground, it would not have given us tactical advice and assist, which we weren't doing anyway at, at that time. But, but I believe it would have given us the opportunity, along with the 4,000 or so NATO troops that would have stayed with us, 
the ability to continue to influence Afghan operations on the ground. And Carla, remember, the ultimate aim was to go after the counter-terrorist targets. And that's why we wanted to support the ISIS and Al-Qaeda, which is why we wanted to support the Afghan military on the ground. And General McKenzie, you said, uh, when you said we would have Bagram, Secretary Lloyd Austin said in testimony on September 28th last year, he believed as many as 5,000 troops were needed to operate and defend Bagram. Are you disagreeing with him? No, it, it, here's the distinction. At 2,500, the assumption would be you would have the Afghans to help you defend Bagram. And that's the and difference. Also NATO? And, uh, and also NATO. And also NATO, although we, we did most of the work. There was some, some NATO assistance up in Bagram. But the, the, see, the, 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 here's the theory. At 2,500, the Afghans will still stand and fight. Therefore, you're going to have Afghans defending the perimeter of Bagram. It would not have required 5,000. His number is probably not a bad number if we had to go in and defend Bagram by ourselves. And I would agree <clears> with the secretary on that. But I'm talking about a different case. I'm talking about a case where we still have, we still are maintaining relationship with the Afghan military on the ground. They're still standing beside us. And we believe that 2,500, that would in fact ensue and that would be the way forward. And then one more question before I turn to you, General Votel, um, just because General McKenzie, you mentioned um, Bagram, I, I'd like to go back to that July 2nd handover. You know, it was done at night. There was little warning. About 20 minutes after uh, the U.S. handed over Bagram, the electricity went out. Um, demoralizing was what one Afghan soldier told a reporter on the ground that day. Um, do you regret how that went down? And, and why do you think, in your opinion, weren't the Afghans prepared to take over what was arguably the most critical base in the fight against the Taliban? So our commander on the ground on July the 2nd was General Scott Miller. He did an exhaustive turnover of that airfield with the entire chain of command of the Afghan military, from the ministerial to the tactical level. Now, I, you can find people on the ground that aren't going to know about it. Uh, you know, in any organization, you're always going to be able to find somebody. But I would tell you that was actually a pretty well-planned turnover. At the same time, though, you want to maintain an element of tactical surprise about when we are actually departing. So not every Afghan soldier on the wall at Bagram knew what was happening. That's true. But the chain of command knew what was happening. And I am not probably the best person to comment about failures within the Afghan chain of command to, you know, to get the word down to their forces. And I regret that. But I, I would challenge the assertion that we did not fully coordinate that movement out of Bagram. That was a key priority for Scott Miller and his forces. And I'm confident they did everything they could to, to let the, give the Afghans as good a chance as we could to maintain control of that base. So it was the Af Afghan leadership on base, you think, that led to some of the events that happened after with the, the electricity going out, et cetera, et cetera, the looting. Sure. Well, I, look, I think we, we know what happened to the Afghans mm -hmm. writ large in the month of July. They collapsed and lost the will to fight. It happened in other places. We probably shouldn't be surprised it happened at Bagram as well. Well, thank you, General McKenzie. General Votel, um, there was actually a huge corruption problem in the Afghan government and the Afghan military uh, for years and years. Is there anything that you think the U.S. military could have done to, to prevent that and to stop that? Well, I think, I think actually, Carla, we were doing a lot of things. Uh, I know General Nicholson, who was the commander on the ground during my time uh, prior to, to General Miller, and I know General Miller when he was uh, in, in charge there, we, we put a huge focus on this, and this was a constant point of discussion um, with them. Uh, there certainly are some, some, some cultural aspects to the Afghan military, to the Afghan uh, uh, government that uh, lended itself to uh, corruption, and that certainly was a problem. Uh, but there were efforts, I think, that were made to account for account for the resources that we were giving to them to try to implement best practices uh, and to try to make sure we looked after you know, the, the U.S. and, and NATO uh, tax dollars that were being invested into uh, into this country. So I think there were. But but again, this is it is Afghanistan. And this is this is an endemic problem that you know existed before we arrived and unfortunately existed throughout our time there. And, and it was it was a problem that would take time to address. And I think that's how we were trying to address it. Okay, and General Votel, again, last year um, when we spoke, you had mentioned that the 2011 withdrawal of U.S. forces from Iraq uh, was, in your words, a, quote, much more deliberate approach. It left behind a large embassy. It had a security cooperation element of special forces on the ground. What do you feel was missing 
from the approach last year? Well, I, I think the uh, I think the problem was that we had made this determination uh, that we couldn't we couldn't be on the ground we couldn't be on the ground in at any numbers and do it safely and I and I really challenged that I don't think that was the case and I think as as General McKenzie has mentioned you know we had we had several thousand on the ground for a period of time we weren't absorbing a lot of casualties we were bolstering the Afghan government the Afghan forces we were doing important work uh, to keep them them in the game. And so I, I just don't buy the idea that we had to had to pull uh, pull everybody out. And and that um, uh, that I think was was a challenge. Um, and uh, uh, we we did leave a large security cooperation cooperative cooperation element in place in, in Iraq when we left in 2011. That helped bridge us uh, until we unfortunately had to come back in there in 2014 timeframe. Uh, so it gave us a platform. In this case, we largely pulled out everything. I, I think the way I look at this, Carla, frankly, and I look at Afghanistan, I think about it now, is our presence on the ground. I think we have to think of it like an insurance policy. That's that's what it was doing. A, a small, sustainable number of troops on the ground, and, and you've heard the numbers: 2,500, 4,500, somewhere in that somewhere in that ballpark. That really ensures that uh, we can we can support the Afghans and we can continue to look look after our national interests that are present in that country. And thank you. I have one more question for both of you, actually, before I turn over to my colleague, Haseeb. Um, let's talk about the attack on HKIA, Hamid Karzai International Airport. It was the deadliest day for U.S. Americans in Afghanistan in a decade. Uh, there were 170 other people killed as well. Was that attack preventable? And General McKenzie, I'll let you start with this one. We did everything we could to prevent those types of attacks occurring. We, and we prevented a number of those attacks, largely planned by ISIS, delivered either by a human being walking with a bomb or a vehicle uh, born IED. Their, their goal ultimately was to try to get a bomb on an airplane. And we were there to process people onto the airfield, get people in to get them on airplanes to fly them away. If you're gonna do that, you have to have contact with people. That means brave young American men and women are standing out there with the breath of the person you're searching in your face. There's no other way to do that. You can't do that remotely. You can't contract that out. It just takes the enormous courage of American servicemen and women there on the ground doing it. So if you're gonna, if, while we were there was to bring people out. To bring people out, you gotta bring people through the gates. We had already necked down the number of gates. Uh, we had done everything, we, everything uh, in our, within our power to try to minimize the chances of that. But you're in a dynamic environment against a tough, murderous opponent. And sometimes uh, the luck turns in their favor as it did as it did in this case. That's not gonna make it any easier for those families that lost family members. But if, we're gonna, if we were gonna continue to process people, I don't know that that attack was preventable. And, and so you, if I heard you right, you, you guys had, the US military had intelligence that their goal was to try to get a bomb inside the airport and on a plane. They wanted to cause mass casualties any way they could. They fired rockets at us. They maneuver, maneuvered vehicles around to try to get them up to a gate. And then, you know, then, and they, so they had a variety of attack schema that were underway. We were able to thwart the vast majority of those. We were not able to thwart this particular one. Okay, and General Votel? You know, Carla, I don't know that I have much more to add to what uh, General McKenzie said. I think he said it very well, and I think it represents certainly my experience, not only in Afghanistan, but in other places here. The, the enemy always has a vote. They're always trying to uh, gain an advantage and uh, and uh, and and sometimes despite the very best efforts uh, to try to prevent these things to mitigate risk things do happen and that is uh, that is the uh, very unfortunate nature of war and it's the unfortunate nature of this operation right here so I don't think I have much more to add to what uh, General McKenzie's already said. Thank you Hussey. Thank you, generals, for your assessment. Uh, uh, there's plenty of blame to, to, to go around. We have interviewed a number of former Afghan security leaders, be it the National Security Advisor, the former Ministers of Interior, the their equivalent of the Chairman of the Joint Chief of Staff. All of them are saying that they were not provided a fair fighting chance. And, and U.S. leaders are, are, on the other hand, saying that they were not willing to put American troops in harm's way if the Afghans didn't have the will to fight. Uh, some numbers since 
2014, some 70,000 police and Afghan National Army troops died fighting the Taliban, the Islamic State, and, and Al Qaeda across Afghanistan. Uh, uh, the Afghans are basically saying that elite units, the backbone of their military, were promised evacuation and they lost the will to fight. Where does the, the blame lie uh, as far as the fall of the Afghan military is concerned? Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll go to General McKenzie first and then to General Borrow. Well, at the beginning, we talk about the Doha Agreement. And I, it, it remains my opinion that in our language, the defeat mechanism is what you call something that brings final defeat to an organization or, or an entity. The Doha Agreement and the negotiations associated with that were the defeat mechanism for this campaign. I believe that it, since the Afghan government was largely excluded from those negotiations and the fact that we, we ultimately did not proceed along those negotiations on a path of conditionality where both the Taliban and it had to, the Taliban actually had to deliver as well as the Afghan government in the United States. I think that was a deflating experience for the, for, for the Afghan government. So when I look at the problem, I, I don't see it completely as a failure of the Afghan military. I see it as a collapse of the government writ whole. And so it, just as our, as you evaluate our support for them, I think it is wrong to say this was purely a military failure in Afghanistan. I think there's plenty of blame to go around for other elements of the United States government as well. Even as the Afghan government collapsed, so did our plan, our whole of government plan to support them collapse. But again, I come back to, for me at least, what drove it home was the, was the, Af, was the Doha agreement and our inability to successfully negotiate genuine conditional concessions from the Taliban. Thank you, General. General Vaudel? Yeah, no, I think, uh, again, I think uh, General McKenzie has hit on it pretty uh, pretty, pretty clearly here. I mean, uh, the fact of the matter is, is that the Afghan government didn't feel as engaged in this as perhaps they should have. Maybe that's part of our problem, uh, but I would share that that's also part of their problem. These are, these are compromises and they have to come along. And I think they showed some reluctance in terms of, of doing that to try to bring this uh, this uh, this uh, this war to a political conclusion. I think the certainly the American the American leaders, both presidents uh, under which this uh, you know uh, this span, President uh, uh, Trump and President Biden, you know expressed the desire for a for a political solution to this, and uh, and that required the Afghans to come along, Afghan government to come along as well. And so some reluctance on that, I think, does point to some some uh, uh, some responsibility on the Afghan side as uh, as well. Ultimately, the 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 failure of the Afghan troops was largely a result of of a lack of trust in their own leadership, not necessarily an American or NATO leadership in terms of this. And again, I think that is a highlight. That highlights, I think, some of the some of the responsibility that does belong on the Afghan government side uh, with respect to uh, respect to this whole situ unfortunate situation. The, the U.S. has maintained troops in in Germany, in Japan, in South Korea for decades. The Afghan war was always called in the media the longest U.S. involvement, military involvement overseas in history. Why not have a few thousand troops in Afghanistan and let the Afghans continue the fight? They were, for the most part, in the lead since 2014 when the combat mission ended anyways. If the Doha agreement did not allow for that, why not leave a few thousand Marines in the embassy in Kabul? And then, you know, that would have served as an equilibrium and, and allowed the Republic to continue. And we could have told the Afghans that we're not going to get involved. You will resolve your differences among yourself. We're going to protect our embassy and our diplomatic mission. And that would have, uh, some argue, uh, prevented the fall of the Republic. Well, I'll, I'll start with that one. Um, so I think 2,500, that was the number that we, we proposed to stay. It would have been more, much more than just there to protect the embassy. You had to get out and advise at the ministerial level uh, in Afghanistan to be effective. And you had to be able to move around and maybe advise at the core level, the regional level, and provide advice there. Nobody's fighting, but you're providing advice to those Afghan 
commanders who are actually directing combat operations. So you were able to do that in a focused manner at 2,500. Additionally, we, we felt at 2,500, we had reduced our platform to the size where it would have been a hard target for the Taliban to go after. Additionally, we had vast resources from over the horizon in terms of fire support that we could have applied had, we, had they chosen to take us on. Finally, we had felt the Taliban over the last year and a half had gotten somewhat flabby and, uh, and, and lost a lot of their operational practices so that they would have been very vulnerable to us had we chosen to take them on. So that was my, rec that was my recommendation. Look, I, I know there, there are people who say, well, you can't actually do it at 2,500. And that's a reasonable argument, uh, but, I don't, but, I, but we'll never know. That's a counterfactual. I believe in my, my position that a central command in my intelligence assessment was we would not only have kept the 2,500 there, we would have had our NATO partners with us, so it would have been a larger platform. Additionally, we would have uh, wanted to have a whole diplomatic press on the Taliban to try to prevent them from going after us at that 2,500 level. Would that have been successful or not? I don't know the answer to that. I do know what the answer was for going to zero. That's clear to all of us. Yeah, I, I, again, I would uh, I would underscore what uh, what Frank says here. I, I think there is a an irreducible minimum number that we could have left on the ground here that would have uh, continued to provide the necessary support to the Afghan uh, government, to the Afghan forces, and would have helped protect our, the interests for which we uh, we were in Afghanistan. And and whether that number fell between twenty five. 4,500 or somewhere in between. The fact of the matter is, I think there could have been a sustainable number that we could have maintained on the ground for a for a long period of time uh, that would have looked after our interests and would have prevented the situation that we've seen play out over the over the last year. I, I really do fear that, uh, unfortunately, some political narratives the you know this the so-called forever war. We had to end this. We had to get people out. I think. I think this uh, this over uh, overtook uh, I think smart strategic decision making uh, in terms of what we were doing, and we just we just left. I, I, I I'm I'm with General McKenzie here. I, I think there is there is a number that we could have sustained on the ground for a long period of time that would have would have taken care of the Afghans, would have looked after our own interests here, and and we should have we should have pursued that more uh, bigger bigger and with, and, and with the 2,500, would that also, in addition to that, have included some U.S. contractors? The U.S. contractors would have been able to remain those doing maintenance, and would you have kept, I know you said over the horizon, General McKenzie, would you have kept some strategic U.S. aircraft at Bagram, perhaps, as well, if you kept those 2,500? At 2,500, we'd have kept aircraft at Bagram and at HKIA, and we'd have kept the contractor base to support that, and a reduced, but still, what we still would have had contractors there to do the, you know, to do the, the you know, the, the, the sort of daily humdrum things that make a large military operation work, making sure when ammunition gets in, it comes into the country, it goes to the units that need it, not to the bazaar or not to the Taliban. Okay, thank you. And General McKenzie, when President Biden was making that decision, uh, and he said he would pull out of Afghanistan, but not on May 1st, which was what the Trump administration had agreed to, did anyone suggest withdrawing in the winter, as opposed to the August September timeframe, which is right in the middle of the fighting season. We, you know, we looked at, had, we proposed staying at 2,500. You know, and that that course of action was considered uh, and, and, and taken a look at. We felt though that if if, if you were going to get out and you, you had not done anything to prepare the Taliban for staying, you know, not indefinitely but over a period of time, the longer you stayed, the greater the risk of them attacking you would be. So we didn't see any particular gain by staying into the winter. We, we, look, we looked at a variety of alternatives. Uh, you know, it settled finally, the president settled on the, on the end of August is the time when we, would actually, when we would actually leave. But as you get into the winter, the other thing that begins to affect you, uh, Carla, if you're gonna bring people out, weather's a factor now, particularly mm -hmm. in Afghanistan. So you don't really wanna be doing large scale air movements in the winter out of, out of the Kabul Bowl or Bagram for that matter, because you're gonna have weather will become a factor in a way that frankly wasn't uh, in, in, in May, June, July, August. Okay, thank you. And before I go to General Votel, um, General McKenzie, I actually asked this question to Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin a couple of weeks after the evacuation. I wanted to pose something similar to you about the intelligence. The intelligence, um, when the decision was made uh, in April, showed that the Taliban could likely take over 
in sometime in December. And I think by July, that timeline had shrunk to late September. You yourself, I believe, told Politico, you, you wrote that on August 8th, you felt that Kabul would fall in about 30 days. So why did the evacuation not start until August the 14th? And did you request earlier evacuations? So we two, two operations went on. The first operation was the military withdrawal from Afghanistan. And that was complete largely by the middle of July. You know, most of our combat forces were our combat forces were out. The equipment that we were going to bring out was out. So what was left as you went into the second half of July really was the force that we had agreed to leave that would protect the U.S. diplomatic platform. Now, it is my belief that what we wanted was an elegant solution that was not attainable. We wanted to go to zero militarily, yet retain a small diplomatic platform in Afghanistan that would be protected. And that simply was not a feasible course of action. It was not defendable. It was not safe. Um, and so when what we, the alternative to that would have been to withdraw the diplomatic platform as you executed the military withdrawal beginning back in the May timeframe, that would have permitted an orderly withdrawal and you could have, but now here's the other thing, Carla, that we need to consider. We were also planning to bring out a lot of Afghans. You talked about the Afghan elite forces. Uh, had we begun to bring them out back in April, May, June, July, you can see that would have had a pernicious effect on Af the Afghans' ability to defend themselves. So it, it, you, as you consider bringing out a lot of Afghans earlier, you have to think about what would that have done to the Afghan will to resist, which was already crumbling. Would it made it actually have collapsed even faster? That's another counterfactual that, that we won't know the answer to. Um, but but I think we waited too long to begin the evac begin the non-combatant evacuation operation. Beginning it in the middle of August was far too late. And General Votel, during your time as CENTCOM commander, the U.S. intended to double the Afghan special forces from 17,000 to 34,000 within four years. They That force was considered a potential game changer. Did the military, did the U.S. military ever complete that goal of doubling the number of forces? And what do you think limited the Afghan forces, uh, special forces success? Well, I don't, I don't, I don't, I'm not sure I recall whether we actually achieved the, the full goal of doubling it, but we certainly, we certainly came close to it. I mean, we, uh, we expanded the number of uh, commando organizations we had, we gave them more and more uh, aircraft into their special mission wing. We, you know, uh, made, made better use of a variety of different Afghan and uh, special operations organizations that were out in the provinces that were doing uh, very, very good work. So I think we, I think we, we, di we did, we did pretty well in terms of doubling the size of, of all of that. Whether we actually achieved that actual number of doubling or not, I, I'm, I'm not, I'm not certain, and, and I, so I won't hazard a hazard a guess there. I, I guess we've kind of been talking a little bit about uh, about it. I, I think it, I think it is the will to fight, uh, frankly, and uh, and and uh, as as we continue to talk in our strategic communications about departing uh, Afghanistan, certainly as we made announcements at Doha that we were going to, this I think played a, uh, a significant impact in undermining not only the uh, um, the will of the Afghan government and the conventional forces, but really um, the special operations forces as well. And, and, I, and I do think perhaps we did not fully appreciate uh, how much that had been uh, that had been undermined again I, I'm not I was not in the position I was not on the ground so uh, this is my own personal view here uh, but certainly I think that that uh, that uh, that caused a lot of problems I, I'm, I'm I would have expected that the Afghan forces uh, special operations forces would have would have fought much harder much uh, much more to the end but as, as we saw that was not the case we saw completely different situation play out. And I think it all gets down to will um, and the will to fight. And the fact of the matter is that they had to take, uh, they, they chose to protect themselves and protect their families as opposed to trying to save a, a government that was ultimately not going to succeed. Well, clearly we have your, your views. You both wanted to keep forces in. Um, before I get to my last questions and turn it back over to Hasib, General McKenzie, do you feel that uh, Secretary Austin and General Milley advocated as strongly as you wanted them to for your advice, or did you get a sense that this was a fait accompli? Um, I think I think we had an opportunity. I think our advice was heard. I think it was heard at the very highest levels of, of government. And the president makes a decision. The president 
gets to make that decision. And uh, so I have on the same. I, I'm not going to speak for them. Uh, I, I would ask you to, to talk to them about that. Uh, but I but I, I felt my views were heard and, and were heard thoughtfully. And, there's, you know, for a commander, there's not much more you can ask. I get to give advice. They can take it or not. And then I'm going to follow the orders the president gives. And then before I turn it over to Hasib, I want to ask uh, to both of you really quickly, do you feel the U.S. is safer now that troops are out of Afghanistan? And do you feel that the terror groups there have increased their ability to attack, attack the U.S.? We'll so I, 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 or I see nothing to change the CENTCOM assessment that, uh, that if we leave, uh, eventually Al-Qaeda and ISIS in particular are going to go into open space in Afghanistan and the threat to the United States is going to, is going to rise. I, I, so I do not believe we are safer as a result of our withdrawal from Afghanistan. But I also would say the jury's just too soon to tell. It takes a little while for this, for this to manifest. Uh, didn't expect it to happen overnight, but I do, I do not feel that we're in a safer place because we executed that action. General Votel? Yeah, I would agree with that assessment. I think there's a lot in a safer place. There's a lot that we don't know about the organizations, the terrorist organizations that are left on the ground. I certainly uh, was was uh, pleased to see the strike that we conducted a couple of weeks ago against here in Zawahiri. That certainly was an indicator that we maintained some capabilities. That was good. Uh, but I, I think uh, I think everyone should just reflect on the fact that's the first time we've done that since our departure, to my knowledge. Um, so you know we've got to we we've got work to do here, and, and I don't think. We're, we're we're more stable or we're more we're more safe. I think I think Afghanistan is more unstable, and as a result, that this this part of this region is more unstable, and that could be that could cause problems for us down the line. Okay, Hasi. Thank you, generals, for the insightful uh, assessment. According to a CIGAR report, some sixty percent of the Afghan uh, air force and aircraft were basically grounded just weeks after. Uh, uh, the U.S. contractors were pulled pulled out in, in, in June. The, the question with a lot of people is, why have the Afghan Air Force so reliant uh, on U.S. contractors and, and why not allow them to stand on their own feet? Uh, I'll, I'll, I'll ask this to, to both of you and I'll, I'll, I'll start with, uh, with, with, with you, General McKenzie. Sure. So the fact that the Afghan Air Force relied on U.S. contractors is not unique to Afghanistan. Many countries across the world are reliant on contractor support to make those airplanes fly. So that's not unique. Um, what, what was understandable and predictable was if you pull the contractors out, it's going to be very difficult for a largely untrained force to support those, air, those aircraft. And we had a variety, we tried to do a variety of things. I would call them heroic things to try to provide support to the Afghan uh, Air Force. One of some involve breaking airplanes down, flying to over the horizon to do maintenance on them, then bringing them back in. Others using uh, telecommunications to assist the Afghans in doing maintenance. None of those things worked particularly well. But but again, we didn't have a lot of time to really see how it would work over the long haul. I thought it was going to be a significant uphill battle to keep the Afghan Air Force in the fight once we remove the contractor support on the ground. And that was that was a, that was a fact that was well known to everyone who looked at the problem. General Votto? Yeah, I think it takes time to build professional uh, maintenance forces that uh, can stand up on their own. Uh, and I think that's what we are attempting to do over a long period of time. But, you know, I think you have to look at the talent base in, in Afghanistan and the people that are that have the requisite skills uh, to include speaking English and other things that go along with this. And this, this, this I think, uh, highlights the challenge of what we were trying to do on the ground uh, with, uh, with all of that. So uh, I, I think there certainly was an effort to try to, as there is in many countries, to try to train transfer uh, the, 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 the skills over to the host nation to make them self-reliant and take care of themselves. But again, this takes time. And there's a lot of factors that go into this. It isn't just showing up and giving them stuff. It, you have to train people. You have to develop leaders. You have to develop expertise, long-term expertise. And you know, we look at what it takes to build a, to build a mechanic in our own country. Uh, people just don't show up and start working on airplanes. They, they go through a whole, a whole path of professionalism, and that's what we have to do in this situation. So it's a much more difficult proposition than, than I think just providing equipment and showing up with, uh, showing up with stuff. 
And I'm, and I'm going to turn to our audience. We have received thousands of questions from various platforms. Carla and I asked the majority of them, but still, uh, we still have some unanswered. Uh, I have uh, Farad Ahmad Kamali from Afghanistan, and we did talk about the, 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 the so-called over-the-horizon capability and how it works with the uh, recent Al-Zawahiri attack. Uh, uh, he is asking that given the current situation in Afghanistan and the trajectory of the Taliban government, don't you think the U.S. will be forced to get involved in Afghanistan again? Uh, General Vorel, I'll, I'll pose this question to you since you were in office when uh, the so-called Islamic State uh, emerged in, in, in 2014, 15, and 16, and the U.S. had to get involved again in Iraq and Syria to crack down on IS. Sure, sure. Yeah, so I, I think that's I think that is a that is a real concern here, and uh, and what we have seen with these terrorist organizations that we've been fighting now for several decades is that they they morph, they change, they evolve, uh, they modify their practices, they grow in different ways than uh, than we might expect, and that we have to keep constant pressure on them. And I think when we do take pressure off of these organizations, we give them the ability to grow and to and to evolve. And so I am very, very concerned about that. Whether we find ourselves back in Afghanistan again, like we found ourselves back in Iraq, just literally three plus years after we left, I don't, I don't know. I, I hope not. Um, but, uh, but I think we have to, we have to be prepared for that, and uh, we have to recognize that keeping pressure on these terrorist organizations is an important interest for our country. It not only is important for the country of Afghanistan; it's important for the safety of our own nation and our own citizens. I have another question from an Afghan who for security reasons asked not to be named. He was an interpreter for the, the US military and he's still stuck in the country. He says people who did not even work with the US are in the US now. And people like me who worked for years are still living and hiding somewhere in Afghanistan. What will happen to us? We'll, we'll go to General McKenzie for this. Sure. So I think the Department of State is doing everything they can to get those people out of Afghanistan. I think it's going to be a long, hard slog to do that. And I also recognize in August, we brought out uh, a lot of people uh, who were not our primary target. It's just a fact based on who was at the airfield, the amount of time we had and the direction that we were given. I wish it were, wish it could have been different, but it wasn't. We left a lot of friends behind, a lot of people that shed blood with us. Uh, I feel that very keenly. I know everybody that ever served in Afghanistan feels that very keenly. And I believe we're going to try very hard to get those people out. One soldier also who does not want to be named, he's a special forces soldier in Afghanistan, say that he and his unit had the fighting well, but people in his unit were promised evacuation and everybody opted for evacuation versus putting a fight up. Uh, he says, do you think that the evacuation and the way it was handled led to the failure of the Afghan military? Well, it, as Joe Votel has already, I think he's already talked about that very eloquently. I think that was a factor, um, but it comes down to it, it is, in fact, their country, and they've got to believe in it if they're going to actually stand and fight on the ground. Yes, I think the fact that we evacuated people was a factor, but I don't think it was the principal factor involved in the collapse of the Afghan military. General McKenzie and General Vall, thank you very much for your time. I know you both have very busy schedules and these are very tough questions and we will continue to have uh, these discussions in the future. For now, we really appreciate your time and your assessment. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you. This concludes today's panel. Thanks, Carla. Thank you, Carla. Bye-bye. Thank you.